Brief Teats is sponsored by Brightwell Aquatics and Ball Creek Supply. Today we're talking calcium reactors. What's going on guys? Devin from Reef Deeds. So the last little while I've had a lot of questions on calcium reactors and I had some kind of special requests to do some things on kind of calcium reactor mistakes and so I figured it's been a while since I've done a video specifically on them so today we're going to dive into that. Now the very first question I get constantly is should I get a calcium reactor? Should I do dosing? How do you know when to get it? And most people recommend them based on tank size. I personally don't think tank size is a very good way to go. I think it comes down more to coral load. Cause you could have a 50 gallon tank packed wall to wall, or you can have a 400 gallon tank with two frags in it, right? The tank size doesn't really make a difference. Um, it's how much coral load. So kind of the way I think about it is two part dosing is really easy to set up. I mean, Kelk Wasser's super easy to set up. Um, but there's gonna be a point, if you have a really big tank, if you're dosing you know, 150 mils a day or 200 mils a day, there's gonna be a point where you're gonna feel like your two part is starting to get expensive. And once you get that point is kind of when I think it's worth considering calcium reactor. Um, so calcium reactor is expensive up front, but it's very cheap to run. So it's kind of what you gotta look at. So calcium reactors seem intimidating, but they are actually very, very simple devices. Um, now I can show you two, two different variants. So this is my Geo one, super simple design, um, really functional. Sorry, it's a bit cluttered in here, but if you look at the top, the, it sucks water from the very top of the lid. It goes down to the pump and it pushes out the bottom of the reactor. So that pump is constantly circulating water through the reactor. Now this is just full of tank water. Now, the liquid inside of here, what we do is we take tank water and we push it through the reactor, then we drip it back into the tank. And that's called your effluent. And the effluent's the output of the reactor. Now, it's tank water running through media. Now, the only difference here is we're melting this media. And as the media melts, it is going to release calcium and alkalinity and add it back to your tank. Now, it can also dose magnesium as well. Uh, if you look inside here, you've got these little white chips. Um, that's Brightwell Neomag added to mine, and that's going to add magnesium as well. So it can cover all your dosing. You might want to consider adding trace on top of it, but this is going to cover all your bulk dosing for the tank. Now I also have calc washer on the tank. This is not required. I just did this to get a little more of a pH boost. But all my dosing is done from the calcium reactor. Now to kind of give you a bit of a reference on this, I have a 10 pound CO2 tank in the back, and I just refilled it for the first time after about, I'm going to say, close to a year and a half and it was 30 bucks to fill that so pretty cheap um, and I also topped off a little bit of media inside of here so this media lasts a long long time so I've maybe added about that much media in about a year so I, obviously as the tank grows you're gonna consume more but it does last a long long time so now you don't need two chambers um, what I did with mine I have my main chamber this recirculates and I took the output of this one that would normally go to the tank and piped it into a second chamber. So it comes in at the bottom and it slowly percolates all the way up and then that goes to the tank. Now the purpose of the second chamber, if you want it, is to soak up a little more of that CO2. So as you can see, I have bigger chunks inside of this one and smaller chunks inside of here. So all that extra surface area is gonna absorb a little bit more of that CO2 and give you a little bit more of an alkalinity boost out of it. Now for the big main chamber, I have two little fishies reborn and the Brightwell Neomag in there. And inside the second chamber, this one is a mix of Carib Sea Arm and Brightwell Lazarus. So it's very, a lot of smaller particles. That's strictly just for pH boost. Not required, but nice to have. So like again, like it looks like a lot, but it's very, very, very simple how this works. Even this one, look at the top. We got two ports. So we got water in, water out, and there's one more port on the side to inject CO2. That's it. Very, very simple. Now, the main thing that seems to trip people up with the calcium reactor is how do you dial in that stable alkalinity? How do you keep it, you know, if you're targeting 8.5, how do you have 8.5 today, 8.5 tomorrow at the same time? Now, there's two ways to adjust the calcium reactor. The first way is with your bubble count. So your bubble count is how much CO2 you're injecting. So the more CO2 you inject, the lower the pH inside the reactor, the more media that melts, which is gonna give you a higher alkalinity to the tank. So you could keep your Affluent to your dosing feed pump consistent, so you have a constant flow rate through it, and then you adjust your alkalinity by how much media you're melting, right? So you want to melt more media, add a little more CO2, it's going to increase your elk. Now the other way to do it is keep your pH inside the reactor stable at a certain set point, 
and then you'll adjust your fluent. So you're, you're melting a certain amount and then you're adding more alkalinity by dosing more. And that's kind of one way I find is a nice easy way of doing it. Now, if you have a CO2 controller, it will make your life easier because it's a lot easier to kind of dial things in. Um, you can basically just set it to be at a certain point and it's gonna turn your CO2 on or off and keep it at that number based off the pH number. Now, if you wanna get fancy, this is where things can get really cool or it could be a little more complicated. If you have something, an aquarium controller, like a GHL, an Apex, a Hydros, one of those, you could hook up your pH controller, use a pH probe and have your controller turn on and off. But when you have something like an auto tester, then you could have it control it based on your alkalinity level. So you can start to do a lot of cool stuff, right? So if your alkalinity is above a certain point, turn off your CO2. If it drops down, turn it back on or similar things. If you want to keep a constant flow rate through it, you can have it change your set point of your pH so it can move up or down to adjust a little. So there's a lot of ways you can do it. So it can be complicated, but it absolutely does not have to be. Now, if you want, you don't have a controller, you don't have a CO2 controller, you just have, you know, you have a continuous duty dosing pump, which you ideally want for this, as well as your solenoid. So now if you're not using a aquarium controller, then I would recommend going for the carbon doser. Uh, that's the one I use in my tank. It's an electronic one and it's very, very consistent. That way it'd be a lot easier. So you could just use a little pH tester and test the, your effluent pH. And you would be able to dial it in that way as well without using the aquarium controller. So aquarium control is definitely nice to have, but not required. And if you don't, then carbon dosers, not the cheapest regulator, but I would recommend going that direction. So overall, Lots of cool stuff you can do with a calcium reactor. Um, it seems intimidating, but it's really not that bad. Now, if you look at the Geo one, that is a super simple design. I love the simplicity of it and it works extremely well. Now, I also have a Cove one, which looks a lot more crazy because a lot more tubes going on, but I'll show you that one as well. So now the Cove reactor actually kind of reminds me of my old Vertex reactor. It has a very similar design, um, similar pump. But it's been actually a very solid reactor, super quiet, which has been good. Um, similar thing, except this one has two chambers built into it. So the water circulates between the two different chambers. Um, and same thing, but it's the same general concept. I have a feed pump, so it's sucking water from my tank. It is pushing it all the way through the reactor. And then once it does a big loop, it gets dripped back into the sump. So they're all the same concept. There's a few different little features on this, like this is a recirculation line. So there's any gas trapped in the top, it will get sucked back in through here and be recirculated. Um, if you see the little line down there, there's, that's where my CO2 gets injected, so it gets injected by the pump. And same thing, just the two chambers, there's a little valve to adjust how much mixes between them. So this one definitely looks a lot more complicated, but they both perform the same function. Now, there's many amazing things with a calcium reactor, but it does have one dark side or one kind of downfall, and that is that the CO2 rich water does lower the pH of your tank. So as we're dripping this alkalinity rich effluent into the tank, we're also adding in a bunch of CO2 more acidic water, and that's what's going to suppress our pH a bit. Now, there's a few little tricks that you can do to kind of help along with this. One is adding that second chamber to it, which will absorb a little more of the CO2. And another trick that I actually learned from Chris from ACI, if you output this close to your skimmer chamber, it's actually going to suck it in and your skimmer will help degas some of that CO2. So it's not a huge difference, but it all adds up, right? So that's another trick you can do. Now I have also this, I've not personally experienced this, but I've heard of other people stating that they've had a buildup on the edge of their calcium reactor output line. Now I think this happens if your effluent is too low and it's a very slow drip with lots of air. Um, now, you can just put your tube underwater, then there's no air exposed, and it kind of completely eliminates that issue. Now, on the flip side of that, that extra bit of C2 in the water is also great for refugium, so it will likely help your refugium grow better. So, that's a bit of a trade-off, but having that chato is also going to help absorb some of that CO2. So, calcium reactors look complicated, but they're not that scary. They're, they're fairly simple once you kind of wrap your head around the concept of it. Now, once you get past that initial investment, they're extremely cheap to run. Like that a year and a half out of that CO2 bottle, and it was like $27 or something to fill it. Um, same with the media. Like I used that much media over like a year. So it's really, really cheap to run. And that's kind of one of the big advantages. The other big advantage is the stability. Um, I do have an auto tester for elk on my tank and I get about a 0 0.09, 0 0.1 swing. So if I'm 8.5, you know, 12 hours later, I'm 8.59. 
So it's pretty dang good. So the stability is really one of the biggest factors with it and the super cheap to run. Now, whether or not your tank's ready for it, whether or not it's a jump you wanna take, I mean, that's a decision that's up to you. But generally what I give people for advice is if you feel two parts expensive, that might be the time that you start looking at a calcium reactor. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this. If you have any questions at all on calcium reactors, let me know in the comments below and I'll be happy to answer them in a future update. If you guys enjoyed this, hit that thumbs up button if you're new, make sure you subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.